Hey folks, it's Dan here from the Podcast Digest. Thanks very much for downloading and listening to episode 51. Another great episode for you guys. I really hope that you enjoy it. There are a ton of you out there listening right now who are fans of movies, maybe fans of particular actors or actresses. The question I have for you, though, is how much history do you know about Hollywood? So much of it has been lost and or forgotten. And if that rings a bell, then you know who my guest is this week, Karina Longworth from You Must Remember This, one of my favorite shows I've discovered recently. Karina does an amazing job with her podcast, and it is just like so many of the other shows I've talked about here on the Podcast Digest, something I really feel should be a part of your subscription list. So my conversation with Karina is coming up in just a few minutes, but before I do that, I just want to give a very special thank you uh, to all of you listening right now. In the last uh, week or two, the Podcast Digest has really uh, sort of gone up to the next level, if you will, with appearances on the iTunes charts, and uh, it is amazing how humbling that is, how wonderful it feels to know that so many people out there are enjoying what I'm doing from the basement of my house, and uh, apparently uh, at least a couple people uh, enjoy hearing this, and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen. If you do, a review or rating on iTunes would be a really big deal to me, and I would greatly appreciate it. So with that said, without further ado, Karina Longworth from You Must Remember This. folks and welcome back uh episode 51 of the podcast digest as i mentioned up front my guest this week is karina longworth from you must remember this one of my favorite shows i've only found recently although it's been around just a bit and i'm happy to uh, be, be joined here today by karina to talk about uh, her excellent work karina welcome to the podcast digest hi thanks for having me and thanks for joining me and um I found out about your show, I don't know, what is it, four or five weeks ago, and I have been sort of popping all through your back catalog now, checking out all kinds of fun stuff, and uh, there's so many interesting stories about the show, I imagine. But before we get into that, I want folks to learn a little bit about you, and I was going through your website and um, looking at all the things you've done. Can you sort of summarize for us uh, the road to uh, creating this show? Sure, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, <laughs> I uh, uh, I have a master's degree in cinema studies, um, which is not you know making movies. It's studying the history of film and um, film theory and and film criticism. And uh, when I was in graduate school, I wasn't really sure if I was going to be an academic or what I was going to do. And what ended up happening was that I was starting to get work writing about contemporary film uh, while I was still in school, and that kind of made the decision for me. Um, because it, you know, beat working in restaurants, which is what I was doing um, to put myself through grad school. So um, I just very quickly, you know, when I was about, you know, 24, 25, started getting a lot of work writing film reviews, basically, um, for different websites. And um, I was brought into a website um, about movies, like one of the first sort of in, you know, one of the first film blogs that was being run, not as like a personal diary, but as a business. I was brought onto that as one of the first members of the staff. And actually, like, by the time the site launched publicly, I was made the editor in chief. And that site was called Cinematical. And it um, f basically, within like six months, it got sold as part of a package of blogs to AOL. Um, and it, it has since been moved, it has since then been rolled into Movie Phone. Um, but um, if you were sort of paying attention to the internet <laughs> in like 2005, 2006, 2007, Cinematical was sort of one of the first big movie blogs that had a lot of contributors and was covering, you know, movie news, like casting news and posters and stuff like that, but also writing essays about new movies and old movies and um, just trying to be really comprehensive about all kinds of film. Um, so when the site got sold to AOL, I got a job at AOL, which wasn't super satisfactory. <laughs> and I, uh, went looking for basically just like somewhere else where I could do what I really wanted to do, which was write about movies. I ended up, uh, becoming the blogger for a, uh, social network for film fans called Spout, which is also now extinct. Um, but I was there for two years and shortly after they f basically folded, um, I got, hired as the film critic and film editor at the LA Weekly, which was kind of a dream job for me because that had been like the, the alternative 
news weekly that I had grown up reading as a teenager. Um, and it had been really important to me in terms of even just finding out about cinephilia and finding out that there were things like repertory screenings and there was a whole culture of people going to see old movies and weird movies, um, movies outside of the, the mainstream. Um, so I was there for three years and I, even though it was a dream job, I, I really burned out. Um, partially because of the workload of the specific job, but also because um, in being a film critic, you're kind of required to see almost every movie that's released, large or small, and to have an opinion about it. And I found that that is not a natural thing for me. Um, you know, of the 500 movies released in a year, I probably care one way or another about 50 of them. Right. And so um, it was really draining for me. And I also really missed what I used to do, you know, what I went to graduate school for, which was study classical Hollywood cinema. Um, and so I, I left that job. I wrote a book about Meryl Streep. Uh, I worked on another book and I started teaching. And I was just sort of feeling kind of not like a little directionless and like not really sure what I wanted to do. And it really became, um, unbearable, I guess, while I was teaching because I was working really hard and I just wasn't, it didn't feel like the right situation for me. And so I had a spring break from teaching where I was going to have like 10 days off. And I decided that I needed to use it in order to create something that was exactly what I wanted to do. And so I'd been thinking about it for months and I knew that I didn't want to just start a new movie blog. I knew I didn't want to like try to get a column at somebody else's website I knew that I was burnt out as a consumer of that kind of information. Um, but I knew that I, as somebody who listens to podcasts, there are never enough podcasts. Um, I'm always running out of the things that I'm subscribed to and I'm always looking for more. So I, and I also knew that there weren't any podcasts about old movies. Um, and that most of the podcasts that are about movies, you know, and nothing to dis not to disparage any specific shows, but a lot of them are just a couple of people talking to each other. And I knew that I didn't want to do that kind of podcast. I knew that I wanted to do something that was composed and cinematic. Um, so I spent those 10 days of my spring break from my teaching job trying to figure it out. And I did research about a specific story, and I wrote a script, and I recorded it, and I taught myself how to use GarageBand. And at the end of 10 days, I had what I called a pilot for the show. And I put it up on SoundCloud and I just, I basically like asked my Twitter followers and like sent an email to some people like asking them if they would listen to it and give me feedback. And the feedback, you know, I mean, it was definitely, there was some criticism and fairly because I didn't know what I was doing. I was teaching myself how to make the podcast that I had in my head. Um, but for the most part, the response was really positive and encouraging and people were like, yeah, you should make more of these. So I started making more and that was uh, like, that was last April, so I've continued to do it since then. I want to go back, Eve. I want to. I was thinking about this pun in my head. I don't want to use it, but I'm going to. I want to press the rewind button a little bit further back uh, because I think this is something folks want to know. Looking at your resume, if you will, your previous experience, you have you've been a writer, you've been a columnist, you've been an editor, a podcaster, all around. You've been to school with degrees in the cinematic universe, if you will. Where did this love of movies start? Obviously, something very young, right? I mean, that's a question that people ask me a lot, and I don't really have a good answer for it because it, to me, I just never really knew about being interested in anything else. I mean, the only things that I was interested in as a child were movies and baseball, and nothing's really changed. Um, so, I, yeah, I just, I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it has something to do with growing up in Los Angeles, but um, it's not like my parents were in the industry. Um, they did love movies, though. Um, and, you know, my mother definitely took me to see, like, all of the old Disney animated films. They were all, all being re-released in the 80s when I was growing up. And that was just the most exciting thing for me. And I wasn't really allowed to see adult movies until, you know, I was maybe 10 or 11, like, for a really long time. But we had the Disney Channel, and the Disney Channel would show, like, live-action movies from, you know, with the classical Hollywood. They would show movies like Topper and Bringing Up Baby. So I would see that stuff, and then I, you know, eventually when it when it was added to our cable, I eventually started watching uh, Turner Classic Movies. I was a really early adopter of that. Um, and then when I, you know, became a teenager and was sort of allowed to start making my own pop cultural decisions, I, I was just always interested in in Hollywood history and in, in movies. 
old and new. I like subscribed to Entertainment Weekly from the age of 12. Uh, there was a newsstand down the street from my house that I would have to pass like on my walk home from junior high and I would stop there and flip through Daily Variety. Um, it just felt really normal to me and nobody was nobody ever told me it wasn't normal. I didn't really realize that it wasn't normal until I went to college. That was my next question was did it uh, did the light uh, go off in your head that you were more impassioned or interested than maybe some of your peers in school. You're talking about 11 and 12 years old when you were when you were 12 and you just got a new subscription to Entertainment Weekly and you read this great article and you tell your friends were they like you got a subscription to what? <laughs> Was there any reaction? No, not no? at all. No, I mean, first of all, like I didn't really have like friend friends until I was about 12, um, and then. I think everybody that I went to school with, with was like a voracious pop culture consumer and people were, you know, more up on stuff than I was always. And to some extent, like in junior high, there were people who had parents in the industry and so they were bragging right. about going to early screenings of Jurassic Park and stuff like that. Um, but I definitely, if anything, I like felt pressure to get more information than anybody else had. Quick left turn here, going through your bio. One more thing I want to talk about before getting into the show itself. It mentions on there that you've had the opportunity to speak at several different panels on, on film festivals and things of that nature. Can you tell me how that came about? It was just sort of from the writing that you've done and, and, and the work with the websites. And, and maybe what was that experience like for the millions of us who are never going to do something like that? Um, yeah, I think every time that I've been asked to do it, it's basically been because I was somebody who was writing about contemporary film. And um, for a long time, I was sort of specialized in writing about independent film and documentaries. And so, um, you know, I was it, a lot of people who do that for a living get asked to be on film festival panels. And yeah, I don't know. I don't really like doing it. <laughs> okay. um, I feel really I, I get stage fright. I have um, a lot of trouble speaking in public. And I when I first started doing stuff like that, when I was like 24 and 25, I guess I thought that I would get used to it and that the nervousness would go away. But over time, it's just gotten worse and worse. And so I usually say no to um, requests to do stuff like that nowadays. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's more stressful for me than it is rewarding. So the writing, is that more rewarding? I want to talk a little bit about the books that you've you've released as well. I was looking at those on Amazon and, and, and trying to kind of get a, you know, reading the summary of what it was. Sort of what was the process like when you decided, you know what, I think I'm going to write a book. And, and what was that process like? Well, the first three books I worked on, um, I was approached by a publisher and they were like, we have books that we want done and we need a writer to do them. <laughs> um, so it, what, there wasn't a lot of agency in terms of coming up with the ideas for the books. Um, but at, like after I did, I did a short book about George Lucas and then I did um, a longer book about Al Pacino. And then I did one in the same format as the Al Pacino one about Meryl Streep. And it was in writing the book about Meryl Streep that I um, kind of made a decision to depart from the format in a way because I, I had an actual argument that I wanted to make about her career that I couldn't find evidence that anybody else had made, um, you know, at a, in a book length. So um, that was a little bit different. But all of those books were commissioned, um, as was uh, the book that I worked on most recently, which is called Hollywood Frame by Frame, um, which collects contact sheets from still photo sessions for classic movies. But I'm working on a book right now, which hasn't been announced yet, so I, I can't announce it. But it is something that I came up with the idea for and I pitched, and um, it's from like a major publisher, and I'm very excited about it. I was going to say, does that feel like a, a different creation process than the ones that were commissioned? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the ones I'm proud of every book I've worked on. I'm most proud of the Meryl Streep book because it is the one that's sort of the, the most in my voice. But those weren't, um, I don't think of them as sort of creative things. Um, whereas the thing that I'm doing right now, it's, it's, it's going to be heavily researched um, and it's a work of history, but it also is something, it's, a, you know, a showcase for me to like present my unique analysis of of hollywood so yeah it's very exciting heavily researched is a, a great segue into talking <laughs> about you must remember this because i think there are a dozen different words or more that i could use to describe your podcast but heavily researched is definitely a couple that i think are, are certainly fitting 
for anyone who's not familiar with the show itself, and, and I love your tagline, there's something about the slash, the Andor, that I just, I love it. Uh, can you tell a folks? A lot of people don't. So I it's really, just, I love it. I think it's, yeah, I, I it's get, got I character. Got that. <laughs> really? I, uh, yeah. Tell folks generally about the show and kind of sort of what you were originally setting out to do and uh, so on. Sure. Um, well, the show is called You Must Remember This, and um, it's called, you know, this. the tagline is that it's an exploration of the secret and or forgotten history of Hollywood's first century. Um, and the designation of Hollywood's first century is, it's just, just sort of a dramatic way of saying that it's about 20th century Hollywood, um, which to me is, it's, I mean, I have this sort of grander theory, it probably will sound a bit pretentious, but People talk about the 20th century as being the American century, and it is that, but it's also the Hollywood century. Um, it's the century in which Hollywood became codified as an industry and um, became dominant, the, the dominant sort of communication venue. Um, and it, if you want to talk about like the American experience of the 20th century, then Hollywood was often feeding into it and reflecting it, um, and you know sometimes manipulating presenting a manipulated and skewed, um, version of it. So that's why, and it's, you know, it's just exciting to be able to do something where sometimes I can talk about silent films and sometimes I can talk about like, you know, actresses of the 1950s. And sometimes I can talk about Madonna. Um, I can almost do anything I want within those constraints. Um, so every episode is, you know, between like 30 and 45 minutes usually. And, um, I like when I was first talking about it to people, I kind of called it, uh, I think this American life means, uh, this American life meets Hollywood Babylon. Um, but actually neither of those references are totally accurate, uh, because Hollywood Babylon is, uh, mostly, uh, apocryphal <laughs> and, uh, this American life has, you know, multiple contributors. And one of the things that my show doesn't really do very often at all is have interviews, um, Almost every episode, I mean, every episode so far has been um, consisted of a script that I write after doing extensive research. And then I read the script. And I, when I bring in other audio sources, oftentimes they're film clips or I write a role for an actor to play. Um, and it's almost always, the, they're almost always their lines are taken directly from history. They're quotes that people are, people, you know, actresses, directors, whoever are quoted as having said, and then I find somebody to play that role. Um, and the whole thing is just told like a story set to music. It's it's so interesting because it, it's almost a combination of so many different things. It's almost like you get to play the role of a writer, but you also get to play the role of a narrator and play the role of a director when you're writing lines for somebody else, if you will, in this audio drama type thing. Uh, it, it must scratch so many different itches for you in terms of you mentioned all the other things you've done and that this is sort of your enterprise and your uh contribution creatively to this 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 thing that you love so much i i imagine you get a lot of satisfaction from from what you're producing um yeah <laughs> i'm really proud of it um it's a lot of work right now it's it's a full-time job i'm trying to change the way that i work so that i bring people on to help me with various aspects of it which I have to do because I'm also trying to write a book. So I, the podcast can't be a full-time job anymore. But um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's definitely my baby. You know, it's, it's the most, it's the thing that I've put the most of myself into if anything I've ever done. Tell me about this production process. When we talk about full-time job, step us through what an episode looks like for you. It really depends on the episode, but um you know, sometimes I'll start doing the research as much as six months before the episode is actually, you know, uh, produced and and aired. Um, but for the most part, like that would be sort of preliminary research, kind of like learning background information about whatever the subject is. Um, usually to write a single episode, it would take between like two and five days of reading and one day of writing. And, um, and then once the script is written. Um, it takes me between two and three hours to record it. And I've been doing all of the audio editing myself. I'm going to soon stop that, but because I'm not a professional audio editor, that also takes me a long time. It takes between like six and 12 hours to edit a half an hour episode. Um, it's also, a, they're intricately edited, but it shouldn't take me that long. I was going to say um, you're, you're doing a great so. job because it sounds wonderfully edited. 
Thank you. It's really, really hard for me. That's the, definitely my least favorite part. And, you know, it's, I, I want it to be, you know, a high quality production. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes I get sort of criticism from audiophiles or from people who are maybe listening more closely than the average listener. And I, part of me, like, feels really bad about those negative comments and wants to do better. And part of me feels frustrated because I'm like, I give you guys so much, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> right, I right. do, I do so much on every episode. And I, sometimes I sort of feel a little bit like, what do you want from me? Had you any prior experience in audio in the sense, you know, had, with the books you read, had you ever converted them to an audio book and done the narration yourself? Any narration yeah. prior experience at all? No, as an undergraduate I, in art school, I learned how to use, um, you know, just like basic audio recorders and I um, learned how to use video editing software. Um, so conceptually, I I kind of understood like how this would work, but no. And it, you may want to say that it's it's a, a byproduct of the, the editing process, but irregardless, your narration is so perfect now. I mean, I've yeah. I've listened to so many episodes now, and what's funny is that now when I'm watching movies or reading an article about Hollywood, I, I can almost hear your voice in my head now. Maybe I've binged too hard in the last 30 <laughs> days or so, but your delivery on these episodes, it's just like, it's, it's quickly becoming almost the voice of a Hollywood story to me, and it's excellently done. I, I, your narration and delivery of these stories, you, the ability to translate your written word into conveying the message that you intend to convey is, is coming off extraordinarily well. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I mean, of course, like I'm, I write the scripts knowing that I'm going to say them out loud, but they're not really that different from, you know, just the way that I would write a his, like film historical prose um, with, if I wasn't being edited by anybody. Can you tell us a little bit about how you choose the topics that you choose? And I want to have a separate discussion about the multi-parters because, uh, you know, like so many people who are probably hearing this today, we've all been recently uh, enthralled with the Charles Manson's Hollywood episodes. But just generally speaking, how, when you say, OK, here's what's next up on the roadmap for an episode, here's the topic, how do you how do you decide? And there seems to be like an unlimited amount of topics, correct? Yeah, I think there probably are. Um, but I, at first, I would say like maybe the first 10 episodes, it was just what I happened to be interested in at that time. Um, and then I had this book coming out and I was looking for ways to promote the book. And so the next 10 or 12 episodes were all stories that were somehow related to the book. Um, and then I knew I had been reading just like various different things. And I knew I wanted to do something about world war two. Um, and so I did like basically like kind of a two part long, well, I mean, it ultimately was like 15 parts, but it was sort of divided into two between episodes about actresses and their sort of work and lives during world war two. And then, um, like male actors and directors, um, during the same period. And, I, so that, you know, that basically took us up until, um, I don't know, May. And then I, I'd been wanting to do this Charles Manson series for a really long time. Um, I was going to do it at the beginning of this year, but I knew that I needed to take a lot of time to do the research. And because of just like stuff behind the scenes, I wasn't able to take any time off, um, before, before I would have had to start it if I needed to just, if I was going to start it in January. So, um, I, in basically after the star Wars series, I was able to take like two to three weeks to, and by time off, I mean, I don't take time off. Like I'm not on vacation. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, sometimes it's frustrating to me when people are like, like, like I can, you're on vacation right now. I, I always call it hiatus because I mean, when television shows go on hiatus, that's when, um, the writers are writing scripts, but so that's basically what I do when I go on hiatus is that I do research and I write. Um, so it, yeah, the, the Charles Manson thing, I wanted to do it six months ago, um, or more than six months ago. And I just wasn't able to find the time to start doing the research until, you know, the end of the spring. 
How far ahead are you working on sort of your playlist? Because I remember when the Charles Manson thing started, I believe, and I'm, hopefully I relay this correctly, on the first one of that series, I remember hearing you say the first of an 11 part series. And I almost dropped my phone. I was like, 11 parts? I am a voracious podcast listener, as you mentioned, <laughs> you are as well. Nobody does 11 parts. And so how did you even know at that time? Had you already sort of mapped this out that it was going to be that many parts? I had mapped it out, but wow. actually I hadn't mapped it out well enough because now it's going to be 12. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> I, had to, I had to add one. Like the one that's – it's uh, it's going to be in a couple of weeks. It's basically the second to last one of the series. I realized that there was like kind of – there was a, sort of a movie story to tell that was sort of too good to not tell. Right. But – um. Yeah, I guess with that one, I, the whole reason to do it was because I knew that there were going to be so many different stories to tell in so many different aspects. And so it, like, it wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been able to really convey everything I wanted to convey if I had made it any shorter. Now, in other series that you've put out, you've sort of intermixed them, if you will. Whereas this one, and, and I could be wrong here, I have to go back and look. This has been more or less straight through. What, what is it? It has been straight through, but okay. what do you mean by intermixing? Um, well, I think with the Star Wars uh, in, or what well, maybe it was the Howard Hughes, you would kind of switch off the uh, consecutiveness of that series right. with a different episode. Is that right. because you're kind Wars, of? No, the Star Wars one was it was all Star Wars, um, but the Howard Hughes, like, yeah, I, I that was before I had ever done a series. Um, and so I didn't know if anybody would want to listen to, uh, two episodes basically about the same person consecutively. And actually I, like, I've never done, never really done a series where I've like aired consecutive episodes about the same person. I mean, with the Charles Manson stuff, even like, you know, a lot of the episodes are not entirely about Charles Manson. They're about something else. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean like in the Howard Hughes stuff, like I, there's still a ton of ton more stories to tell about all of that. Um, I've just sort of like moved on to other things, but I'll, I'll do more Howard Hughes episodes. Do you ever get feedback from folks that have just like caused them to go back and, and, and buy and watch or listen or find something that you've referenced because they've now heard you talk about it? Yeah. That, that seems to be happening to me all the time now. I, (laughs) I, when you said that the, uh, Frank Sinatra, the three disc collection was available on Amazon still, I, I, I looked it up. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm glad that I'm glad people have found that for sure because that was something that I didn't know existed until about a year before I did that podcast. So, and that was one of your early episodes, and that was one of the ones where you could really tell that it was something you had a fascination with. Like you were almost sort of struggling to figure out why don't people like this that much. You couldn't find many people who did. Is and so that is sort of also part of the topic selection. You have a personal fascination with something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not. I'm not going to do an episode unless I'm personally interested in it. Because why bother? Um, nobody's telling me what to do. Um, and I, you know, I spent ten years in journalism where people were telling me what to do and where I wasn't allowed to um, publish something unless like an editor approved it. Um, and you know, I th- I think editors are great. Like, there's you know, obviously a need for them in journalism. But the whole point of me doing this project, like for myself, was so that nobody would be telling me what to do in that way and that I could only I could only spend the time, you know, the enormous amount of time that it takes to research and write these things, I would only devote that time to learning about things that I want to learn more about. And and, and that comes through and that's why I wanted to bring that up when on the Sinatra because it it was interesting because it was maybe a little bit more than some of the ones later where you really brought your own voice into it. And I found that really interesting where it was like, you were like, I had to talk to somebody who, who to convince me why this was so bad, <laughs> you know, and it was almost like your right. own kind of discovery on this situation, which I thought was a really unique perspective on this uh, particular episode. Yeah. What has the reception been like, Karina, since you launched this thing out to the world? Uh, you mentioned a, a minute ago some of the feedback you've received, but by and large, what has the reception been like from listeners? I, I think it's overwhelmingly positive. Um, you know, I, but I've, I've, been some, I've, I've been on the Internet for a long time, <laughs> and the only way to like, live on the Internet is to, I think, is to forget about the nicest things that people say to, about you or to you and to also forget about the meanest things. Right. So I, I actually don't 
I don't know. I don't take a lot of feedback seriously. Um, if I did, I wouldn't really be able to move forward, but, um, you know, I, I would probably get like six really nice emails and then like two negative emails, you know, like it's, it's two thirds nice and then two thirds mean. Yeah, I, I I can completely understand that. And I've heard that from a lot of the previous guests here on the show that have talked about living in an internet world where, you know, those dark corners of the internet will always reach out and tell you things that you definitely don't want to hear. And you can't, you're right. You probably can't let either end of the spectrum get to your head too much. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, with me, a lot of the stuff that's sort of negative is um, really passive aggressively couched as like a friendly criticism. Um, a lot of the stuff is a lot of the criticism I get is actually, I feel like it's very condescending. Um, it, it's people, you know, correcting minor mispronunciations of words, um, and just stuff like that. And, or people, a lot, you know, people scolding me for swearing, um, as like, and saying that it's lazy as though I don't write 5,000 word scripts and like put in every word for a reason. So, um, yeah, like that kind of stuff, I just can't take it seriously at all. But I also can't take seriously stuff where people, you know, say incredibly nice things to me. So, <laughs> and, and I think that probably creates a, a, you know, level approach for you moving forward for sure. And, and obviously, yeah. you know, you never want to sit on your haunches on something like this. So you, you already mentioned, you know, that you want to try to find a, a different approach to the editing and, and that you're constantly looking for ways to improve. Uh, what are some of the things looking back at the catalog so far that you'd like to maybe do different or better moving forward? Um, I guess I just, I want to, you know, keep um, evolving in terms of the storytelling and, and the craft of the show. I'm really proud of the episodes where, um, just creatively, I've maybe done something a little bit different. Um, like the Lena Horn episode is one where I worked really hard on that so that, you know, I, I'm, as I mentioned, like sometimes I'll have an actor come on and, and play somebody from history. But with the Lena Horn episode, I had found a bunch of archival audio of her talking and it was just too good to not use. And so instead of having somebody speak for her, I had her speak for herself. But I mean, that turns, that turns the process really into, like editing an entire documentary. Um, and so that was, uh, that was an episode where instead of it being like a 40 hour a week, full time job to produce that episode, it was more like a 60 hour a week job. And I just can't do that kind of thing on my own. So hopefully when I have people, um, helping me out, then I can do like, you know, do things that are a little bit more creative th like that. That would be great, especially if, you know, is that something that you look at or is it just becomes too much in, in the way of actually pulling it off in terms of archival audio or uh, clips or, or or do you l prefer the presentation of, you know, putting those words in an actor's mouth type of situation? I like doing both. Um, you know, I, I really feel proud of some of the episodes I've done where I have actors, especially when there are sort of multiple actors, you know, carrying on a conversation. But, um, and it's, I, I mean, it's fun for me to work with actors, but, um, when you have, when you have in the archives, like somebody speaking for themselves, um, and it's like directly applicable to what you're talking about. Like, I think that it can sometimes be too good not to use it. Do, have the actors developed their own fans? Because I've seen, <laughs> I think either on Twitter or in your show notes where you've said, yes, so-and-so is coming back to play so-and-so. And Nate DeMeo does um, some things for you, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if they have their own fans. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, I know the, the... They could answer that better than yeah, I could, maybe. Well, I know the gentleman playing Charles Manson. Uh, you, you can't change him now. You know, no matter how many episodes right. this thing adds up at this point, right. I don't think I'd even recognize it. Uh, you know, he is the voice of Charles Manson to me now. So, yeah. for better or worse, uh, have you had any thoughts on? Um, and again, I know that time and opportunity are going to play a huge role in that. So, hypothetically, setting that to the side for a second, on anything else you'd like to do with, uh, you must remember this. I mean, things like you know, its own book or audio book or, or almost a, a live show type of thing of presenting a story like this with, with dropped in sound clips or something or a video series. Obviously when you're talking about movies, clips would, would go a long way. Have you had any thoughts on any of those type of ideas? 
I'm open to suggestions. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me to do a live show. And I mean, as I said before, like I, I don't consider myself a performer and, um, the, I, I haven't had time to figure out how to do a live show, but I also find the just the idea of it very daunting, um, mm. just from a stage fright pers- perspective. So if I was going to do it, I feel like I would need an incredible amount of help to figure out the technical stuff. It would have to be something where I had like a producer slash director who was telling me exactly what to do. Right. So it would be the opposite of doing the podcast, really, where I just tell myself what to do. Gotcha. Well, that that would make sense. That would make sense. Um, just just a thought. You know, I I was. It seems like your what you've developed is potentially uh, convertible into other delivery vehicles that I think folks would really enjoy. Of course, figuring out how to do that is is a whole nother uh, you know thing to be right. wrestled with. But I mean, I think some people do podcasts, or you know, they get they start a blog, or they do like whatever because they do want that spotlight, and. Um, I think maybe when I was younger, I I thought that like I wanted to be well known, but now I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to be able to do something that is successful enough to keep doing it. And I, this specific thing, I do it because I want to learn about this stuff, and I love sharing what I've learned with people. But um, I don't. I I just. I'm, the more I learn about myself, the more I realize that I, I'm not a natural performer and um, I don't like, I just, yeah, I just feel sort of uncomfortable having too many people pay attention to me. Uh, and then it's probably not a good idea then. <laughs> Doing those type of things. <laughs> One more question for you on the reception thing. Going through your website, I saw that, and and it's it, I thought of this when you mentioned this, but I wanted to wait till I got to this portion of the, the conversation to bring it up. You mentioned you had a subscription to Entertainment Weekly when you were 12 years old. And I understand that I think it was the last year uh, or last spring in 2014 that a little blurb was put in Entertainment Weekly about your show. Yeah. What did that feel like? It was, uh, you know, it was a great piece of press. But in the sense that you'd been a fan of this so long, I mean, I, I can imagine what, what that there had to be a, a sense of pride there, I imagine. You know, I applied for an internship at Entertainment Weekly when I was in school, and I didn't get it. So, oh. um, <laughs> okay. like maybe the maybe the adoration, you know, was, that, that chain was broken then. I don't know, but it was a very nice piece of press, and um, I think it, it helped people find out about the show. So, um, and actually, the person who wrote that blurb has become a friend of mine. So, and I, I think a similar thing had happened with uh, AV Club and Podmas, correct? Yeah, I mean, that was something where, um, you know, Podmas had been a thing that I had used to find podcasts, and I had intended to, you know, maybe after like 10 or 12 episodes to send them an email and see if they would find, like, take a listen to the show, and then they just wrote about my fourth episode um, without me contacting them, and I didn't really feel like I was ready for that attention, (laughs) Um, but it came, and it was very nice, and so... um, I had to just kind of like roll with it. And I mean, that was actually a big thing where I, I had been doing this thing that I thought nobody knew about and I was fig- still figuring out how to do it. And then suddenly there was evidence that people knew about it and I had to start taking it really seriously. Was that a freak out moment a little bit? Um, no, it was, it was just motivational. Well, it, it's uh, obviously worked in the sense of what you've been creating. That's for sure. Um, and, and, and I couldn't see why, those type of organizations and, and, and shows were highlighting even those early episodes. I've gone back. Um, I, I like when I talk with somebody to kind of do the recent, the beginning, and kind of sample the middle. And that's, um, you know, I listened to the first three or four um, right off the bat. And uh, what's interesting is, and, and I don't mean this backhandedly, I actually mean this very much as a, comp, a compliment there is a lot of similarity in the sense of what you were doing then versus what you're doing now in the sense that I think you were probably stronger out of the gates than maybe you're giving yourself credit for because there is a lot of, it doesn't seem as if, if you listen to my show and many of the other shows I featured, you listen to episode one, you know, single digit versus today, you're going to hear a completely different product. I think your catalog has had a high level of quality and consistent delivery all along. And I Thank think you very much. And I think that's why Podmas featured it, you know, because it was there from the get-go, from Jump Street. And that's, you know, compliments to you and what you've done. 
Thanks. I mean, I think that I always knew what I wanted to do storytelling wise. It was just a question of like w- creatively and technically figuring out how to do it. I wanted to wrap up our conversation, Karina, with with sort of a encapsulation, if you will, and I'm going to regret that word from <laughs> once I say this, uh, of, of what I think you must remember this kind of is. And, and tell me if you agree with this, especially because of that tagline or maybe because of that tagline, this jumped to my mind. It almost seems like what you are creating in the process of creating are almost audio time capsules. It's almost like this concept where because of your background and experience, you're familiar with these stories and, and obviously something you're interested in the stories, you become more familiar through the research. And it's like, this is such a great tale that you want to make sure this gets out to the world and the current consciousness and it's not forgotten and you sort of immortalize it in the form of a podcast so that it's not. Is Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, that's definitely fair to say. I think that the reason why I, my initial interest in putting something about memory uh, in the title of the show was just because I think we have really short cultural memories. And I was actually thinking about this when people like, I can't remember exactly when it was, it might've been the golden globes in 2014 when they were, they were going to do a tribute to Woody Allen. It was whatever the, like the last big time was where people were like, Oh wait, like didn't Woody Allen get accused of raping his daughter? Um, and it was just like people were digging up articles from, you know, 1990. Um, and the general reaction was like, I never heard about this. Like, it was just like culturally people had completely forgotten about it. Um, and so when you think about things that happened in the 1930s, um, uh, you know, there's just no cultural memory of it at all. And I think that in so many ways, um, these Hollywood stories are relevant in terms of what's happening in Hollywood now, but also just in terms of, of the way people are, um, you know, like we, the same stuff that people are talking about now and, and, you know, problems that people have in terms of racial issues and class and gender and, you know, just like what it means to like be a human being in the world. Um, like people were going through the same stuff back then. So I just think it's interesting to remember it. Do you think that there's some romanticism that's applied to old Hollywood in that a lot of the reality maybe has been forgotten in I say that because in a lot of your episodes, there is that element of this is what this actress went through. And, you know, had this happened today, you know, everybody and their brother would be up in arms about it. It, Do you think that there is some inappropriate romanticism applied to a lot of some horrible things that were happening back then? What do you mean by romanticism? Where they're kind of gleaning it over and you're sort of looking back at the old films and you're forgetting about the uh, horrible, be it sexism or racism or, th- or the way certain subsets of people maybe were treated and, and that doesn't necessarily come to memory today because people look back at these great old films and it's, those things are kind of hidden behind the, the end product. I don't know. Do you? I think so. I think so. And I... I had that thought from listening to some of the episodes of You Must Remember This. Some of the ways, and, and I know it was a byproduct of the time, right? But but it's a history that existed nonetheless in the sense of the way some of the women actresses were treated or the way some of the casts were treated or even in the Charles Manson series when you were talking with Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski and the way you know he would treat her and it was just right. sort of, that's how it was and it was supposed to be and that nobody turned an eye at it. Right. I mean, I think on one so there's two things. One is that it was, I mean, all of the sexism, you know, in, in all of these eras, it was just normal. Like mm-hmm. it wasn't, it wasn't that Rita Hayworth was being treated unusual. Um, everybody was in the same boat that she was in. Um, and nobody was, if you like stood up and made a fuss about it, you know, like that it would be worse for you. So nobody did that. Also, I mean, even, I mean, even when the, you know, the stuff like, about the Sharon Tate and sort of the sexual revolution actually being kind of a raw deal for a lot of women. Um, I think it's just stuff that people don't, they don't read about, <laughs> they don't know about, you know, they don't think about it. Um, but um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's anybody's fault to romanticize, you know, great movies or great movie stars. Um, but it's part of the reason to sort of talk about these things is just, you know, to have a conversation about a bigger picture. 
Do you think that, um, and I know I said I was wrapping this up, but now other things keep coming to my <laughs> mind, and I apologize. But uh, yeah, um, w- one more question, because I, when I was thinking about that concept of sort of the, the things people are oft to forget or, or may not even be aware of, which is why I think everyone who's listening to this right now should be subscribing to you. You must remember this. You know, I'm of, I, I'm guessing, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you, but I'm guessing I'm of a similar age of you in, in the sense of growing up in the 80s. And your recent episode, well, it wasn't that recent, but the episode on Raquel Welch, and you were talking about her um, – uh, contract not being renewed sort of basically after she hit 40 and there was a question on they wanted somebody younger and so on and so forth. It was so interesting to me in the sense that one, growing up, I never would have recognized that that was happening. Obviously, I had heard of her mm-hmm. and I had seen that process. But now, all these years later, for you to kind of shine a light on sort of this controversy, if you will, or, or, or corporate decision making process and the reasoning behind it. Um, have you ever thought that those might be some other things that you may want to look at. You, you mentioned the, the the one on Madonna, which was another eye opening things. And I'm we already alluded to your episode on Sinatra, sort of. So kind of like modeling and music. Are, do you put all that under the Hollywood umbrella? So this this kind of gives you free reign on any of these topics. Yeah, I mean it's all the entertainment industry. I mean anybody who honestly, like anybody who has aspects of their story that involve them living in Hollywood, I think is fair game. Oh, that's excellent, because uh, there's so many great things that I think people would uh, love to hear about. And on your website, you have a forum where people can suggest things, correct? Yeah, and actually next season is all listener requests. Well, perfect. So um, we're going to pick, like, we're going to go through all of the requests that are there up until about August 10th, and then pick, like, 12 to 15 of them, and that'll be next season. Well, that'll still give folks uh, a couple of days to... uh, to get their requests in. So why don't you tell folks where they can find the website, the show, and uh, any of your other work online you'd like to tell people about? Sure. My website is vidiocy.com, V-I-D-I-O-C-Y. And the website for the podcast is you must remember this podcast.com. But you can also find it on iTunes, um, and you can follow the podcast on Twitter at Remember This Pod. And folks, as always, all those links will be in the show notes. Make sure you check them out. And uh, if you should have already subscribed to this show, if you haven't, folks, I promise that you will enjoy everything that that, that Karina's done so far. It's uh, There's still a few I haven't gotten to, and they are queued up and uh, will be integrated into my playlist as well. Karina Longworth, thank you so much for your time today, and thank you for joining me. Thank you. And folks, that'll do it for episode 51 of the Podcast Digest. Until next week, my name's Dan Lizette, and take care. Thank you for listening to the Podcast Digest. You can follow the show on Twitter at Pod Digest. Like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Podcast Digest. Email the show feedback at the Podcast Digest at gmail.com. And you can find all the previous episodes and exclusive blog entries at the show's website, thepodcastdigest.info. Podcast Digest.